Uh, you know, in the office, we're doing so many different kind of projects, um, which are, you know, what we call the mainstream architecture. And there are also certain projects that are uh, not really project, but our own created projects. And so um, at this point in time, especially after the COVID era or still in the COVID era, um, these, there are a lot of questions that came into mind about, you know, how, the way we practice architecture and who are we practicing for, who are our clients, whom can we, whose lives are we enhancing through the knowledge that we have, uh, you know, we've had or we've acquired through practice and also from uh, learning. So basically, um, thinking of all of those things, we've started a couple of different kind of initiatives. And so I, I decided to focus more today on um, a certain projects which are more to do with, uh, I would say, humanitarian or let's say more to do with people rather than, um, than the architecture that we see. Um, so I'd like to start with this um, image where it shows um, the, the sea level rise and how Bangladesh will be affected by it. And you see here uh, three images of Bangladesh's map, political boundary of Bangladesh. And it shows that uh, within uh, 2050, uh, we are expected to lose or at least inundate to uh, a, a certain area, which is 1.5 meter sea level rise. And the sea level rise around the world is not happening in the same speed or in the same manner. In the Indian Ocean, it is a, a different story. And so Bay of Bengal, which is connected to Indian Ocean, um, has much more, uh, the, the, uh, it, it will be affected far more than many other parts in the world. So Bangladesh is directly uh, being affected in, in many ways. If you go to the coastal areas, you see that the changes and the diversity in the ecology is already um, being affected. So just to give you an idea where Bangladesh is located. So this is the Himalayan range on the northern part, as you see here with the glacial, sorry, the glacial uh, areas up, up there. And from the, from the Himalayan range, there are these major rivers that are coming down. One is Brahmaputra, the other is Ganges. And there's another river that is coming from the Arakan range, which is the Meghna. So three major rivers are coming and uh, converging into this uh, area, which is the Bay of Bengal right here. And while doing so, you know, within, for many, many years, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, it has accumulated silt. And so Bangladesh is actually located on an area where these three rivers has converged. And through a siltation or let's say progradation of the estuary, which is actually the Ganges estuary, this land was created. And so Bangladesh, two thirds of Bangladesh's landmass is actually Delta. And it is the largest delta in the world and home to 150 million people. Um, what is unique about the Ganges Delta is that it constantly moves. It's a very fluid landscape. And as you see here, this is an image, uh, a NASA image of 20 years of movement of the, of the rivers. And as it moves, it actually creates sediments, uh, which are locally known as chor. And, the, uh, and it also, uh, creates these bank erosions, um, which is, you know, a very much affecting uh, or affects the lives of the people who live in these areas. So here, this is what it looks like when there is a riverbank erosion, um, it, mainly because there is an enormous flow of water during the summer months um, when we have heavy rain. And at the same time, there is glacial water coming from the Himalayas. Um, there is an enormous current and the earth is so soft and fragile that it, it starts to break. And it has broken down many uh, small towns, villages, uh, and it, it, till date, that's how it, it, it's, it's, it's been happening. So a lot of people have become landless or homeless, uh, moving to cities. Some who has the ability to buy new land would move into a different place and start to a new uh, life altogether. And as I was mentioning that there's also these new sediments that form in the riverbeds, this uh, we call chore. And they also have a certain life um, 
you know, a chore, once it gets settled, it takes about eight years to settle down and you can really tread on it and start to live on that. But always remembering that this is also a part of the river and it does, it is, it, though it looks like land and you can live on it like land, but the river can take it away anytime that the river wants because it is part of the river. So there is this very precarious uh, understanding of land and water in our location. You cannot uh, distinguish between land and water. They are very much intertwined into each other's uh, territory. And so this map actually shows that, you know, this is a tide dominated delta. And because of that reason, when there is low current, the water generally flows back into the system, the Eastern Asturian system. And that's the reason why we have the sedimentation and the sand beds and the chores that I was mentioning. So in one of our researches that was focusing uh, mostly on these areas of the lower Meghna River, this is the lower Meghna River, as you see here, in this map. Um, we tried to, this was uh, uh, for one certain triennial where we were participating and it was a commissioned research where we tried to locate how the villages move from one location to another. So that's how, what, when, when uh, there is erosion, the entire village generally moves from one area to the next area and um, wherever they can find space. And so the entire villages have keep, keeps on moving. So here you see four different locations where the, the village had moved uh, in its own uh, lifetime. So this is one village that we uh, basically um, uh, were tracing. And in the, in the vernacular architecture, especially in these areas uh, where we have the riverbank uh, erosion or let's say the movement of the water and land, uh, the architecture is very much a flatback system uh, and it is embedded in the vernacular. So people generally make it with a wooden frame and corrugated sheet facades. And um, when they realize that there will be an erosion they immediately take down their houses, uh, facades separately, the roofs, the frames and everything, put it on a boat or a car, and then they move it uh, from one location to a safer location where they can find a place to rebuild their houses. So it's a, it's a mobile system that has already been existing for maybe more than 100 years, 200 years or more. So, um, so it's, it's already embedded into the culture of the vernacular. And you, you can find um, many of these shops where they sell these houses. Uh, you know, it's a modular system, um, the framing and everything. If you want to add to that, you can add a veranda, you can make it two-story, but uh, this is already there. Uh, and so for the triennial where we were, were, were participating with our research, Sharjah is actually one of the states of UAE just like Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And so, um, so in, this is the place or the courtyard that we were given uh, to showcase our, our research. And we bought three of the houses uh, from the market and we took it to Sharjah. So that's the courtyard we were given. <clears throat> and as you see here, this is the houses in their own context. And here in, in Sharjah, this is how we placed it. So we bought three houses uh, one was a two-story house, the other two were more single-story house. And um, three architects from our office and a carpenter went and just reassembled them on site. And here you see inside the two-story one, it's more like a mezzanine rather than a two-story actually. Um, so here in the panels, you see the research work that we showcased. And that's the Sharjah town or the city. And uh, those are the three buildings. And during pandemic last year, while we were all locked in our own houses and there was hardly any work going on in the offices, we decided to take this further. That exhibition was in 2019, 2020, early January. That's when it finished. So we thought, you know, how can we move this forward and make it a mobile modular system, which could be lightweight, easy to build, easy to dismantle, um, and it, you won't need a car or a boat. You could just maybe carry it on a, on a small van or something and, um, and should be very you know, inexpensive so that we can 
help the people who has completely lost their houses and land, more the ultra low income, I would say, people uh, with these houses. So we built this uh, space frame structure, um, which started last year, actually. Uh, so this is basically what we have is steel joints, as you see here in the drawing, um, uh, and, and the bamboos as the main frame. So this is a space frame structure, as you see here. But when you take the space frame structure, which doesn't really require much footing in that sense, it's a very, very small footing, um, maybe a few bamboos, if you, if you just um, put it in the ground and then, and then tie it, that really works. And then from there, a, a little house can be created. And, and it cost us something around $250 at that time. So this was our first prototype last year during the pandemic. This is what we built. Uh, you see this frame structure and then a tin roofing because it's easy to dismantle and carry and you can make better use of it. And the facades uh, on the ground level could be anything. So there are two floors actually. So this is an eight feet by eight feet module that we made. The idea is that the lower level would be for daily activity and the upper level would be more for sleeping. And so this is the first structure. And these are the two architects uh, who built this uh, module and one of our guests trying out. So the idea was that if we can give it to people who are who has lost their homes and land and completely. So what they do is they move from one chore to another chore um, with whatever small belonging that they have, trying to leave off the land, cultivation and agriculture or farming, and also looking after um, uh, livestock. So basically, uh, they move, they constantly move. So a mobile system would really help them uh, in their lives. So after having that little structure built, um, you know, this is a project that we developed our own. It's, it, we don't have any client as such. So what we did is we took it to the chores. Um, so that's the main river, as you see in the horizon, where you do not see any, any land. That's the, that's the main river. And these are two chores. And then this is just a part of the river uh, on which these two chores have formed sand beds. And uh, we went uh, to these areas. It's a chore called Chor Hijla um, in the lower Meghna River. And so we built a few houses here just to try out and see what are the possibilities and what are how people actually adapt to it. So this is our first house where we built a 10, 10 feet by 10 feet module for a family of uh, a, hus a young family, husband, wife, and a child, and a toilet facility, as you see here. Um, the idea is that, this, so this is basically what they have built. So they generally take the grass that grows, the long, tall grass. They make the facade with the tall grass and a, a couple of tin roof, uh, tin for the roof, a very fragile structure, um, and, and we have really large thunderstorms uh, throughout the monsoon season. So, you know, this structure would not last maybe a year. Uh, so the idea was to make it a bit more rigid, a structure that would not just fly off uh, and at the same time give them a place to stay. So, uh, so this is a 10 by 10 module that we created here. And you see, um, um, so that, that's our one of our team members. She goes and sleeps in every 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 project that we build. So what we did is we uh, have these tall grass facades and the tin roof, and the lower level um, would be the daily activity space where they can. Um, he will again you know, use these tall grass to create the facade. So we do not uh, bring in any material from outside except for the bamboo and the corrugated <clears throat> sheet and the uh, steel joints that you see here. Um, the rest of the elements are all from location. So here, uh, that was a single module. And here we have two module a house where this is a bigger family. They have four children, so they needed a bit more bigger space. Uh, so this is the house that they have. So we built something here. Um, so the idea is that they will take these facades and then rebuild the facade on the on the lower level. What we try to do is give them the structure and the roofing um, and the deck, upper deck, so that it's a sturdy structure and then the other things they can build on their own.
So, and it's all voluntary work by architects um, for, uh, who are working with us, whoever is interested. So we go there and we start building. At this moment, we are in the process of building 100 houses. Um, we've acquired a funding. And so we'll be building 100 houses for the people. Um, moving on to another project, which is now going on at the moment where I just arrived yesterday from, this is the Rohingya refugee camps. Uh, as you know that Bangladesh has border with Myanmar on the eastern side, southeastern uh, side, and um, Rohingya uh, are actually uh, Myan nationals of Myanmar. They've been living there for for centuries, uh, but being Muslims, there is this ethnic cleansing that's going on in Myanmar, and they have been uh, for a very long time. I think there was. Uh, this uh, pushing uh, them out of Myanmar has happened for a couple of times in the 90s and even before that also. But in 2017, there was this exodus of Myanmar nationals that had to flee, flee the genocide and the killing uh, from Myanmar to Bangladesh because, and, and they basically walked through by the, uh, the Naf River and then coming to to what is our um, reserved forest in that area. So what you see in 2002 is the reserved forest. This was actually a very important place for elephants uh, uh, in that area. But then as the uh, refugees came in, um, they had, there has to be made space for them. So as you see here, 2017, all the uh, trees were cut to make space for them here and as it's growing in 2001 this entire area is filled with uh, 1 million refugees or 10 million refugees right here and so um, you know these are very soft fragile uh, hilly uh, hilly terrain and um, so when once they cut the uh, trees basically it was entirely um, you know, constantly um, there was landslide happening uh, every time there was a monsoon season. So as you see here, this was um, the UN agencies trying to stabilize the earth uh, for the refugees to make their house. But the, the most important thing is that the trees were holding it on. And when they took out the trees, it immediately became a very, very fragile landscape anyway. Uh, so that's the ruptured landscape that you see. So at this point, um, since from 2017 on, Bangladesh government now is really pressing on uh, the idea of reforestation. So we were engaged to do some reforestation project while we were, we are also designing a few different uh, facilities uh, for the World Food Program. And what we did is we are trying to take the forest floor, uh, which is surrounding that area, uh, and take the forest floor out, as you see here, that's the, that's the actual forest that's existing at the moment in, in, the, in that same area, but a little bit farther away. So we take, take forest floor parts of that, uh, we collect that, and then we take it and, and then we are trying to re-establish a kind of a floor that is completely ruptured uh, because of human encroachment uh, in these areas. So during the monsoon season when there's a heavy rainfall, uh, we are trying to address this by uh, addressing, uh, taking out forest floors and replanting them in some areas. Um, so what we do is, it's a, there's a process how we do it. Uh, it's about also creating a sense of ownership among people. So these are um, the refugees who are living there. So we have these small workshops uh, where we, uh, to talk to them and we kind of try to engage them in, into the whole process of understanding land and understanding the idea that this needs, the environment needs to come back uh, in terms of um, a forest and keeping in mind that there is a habitation in that area, a temporary habitation. So, so keeping all those things in mind, we are trying to engage them, uh, giving them some idea and also learning what they, know about uh, planting and looking after landscapes and everything. So this, these are the refugees, as you see. And we, one of the method is the bamboo nailing method. So there's a lot of bamboo growing in that area. So we take live bamboos, uh, we nail them to the ground, 
so that the bamboo starts to grow and it really anchors the soil again. So bamboo nailing is a process. We have also another method called the mud ball or the seed bomb. Uh, so what we do is we take mud and put the seed inside, make these balls and throw, the, throw them into the landscape where it's not so easy to reach out. So basically, all these different techniques are being employed to reforest these areas in a natural process. Uh, so this is um, one of the projects that we built um, for our own stay, actually, uh, right next to the camp. That's where we go and live uh, when we are there uh, on site. Uh, it's the same, the technique that I showed you, the mobile modular structure. So here we have two different modules, two modules, actually, it's a two module house. Um, where uh, we also engage the local community uh, in a workshop and we all worked together with a model to make them understand how this whole joinery is and the, and the bamboo structure actually works. We also try to understand how they make their own houses in that area. So you know, through a workshop, then we started to build it with the people uh, of that location. So so this is the uh, workshop that you see people coming and building it. Uh, and that's the house uh, that we have built where we stay at the moment. So it opens up. So these are the same module as I was telling you of that uh, structure that we are giving in the uh, Southern part of Bangladesh for the uh, landless uh, people in the chores. Uh, it's the same module that we use for our own stay in the uh, in uh, Ukia. Uh, Fox's Bazaar, which is in the eastern part of Bangladesh. So uh, that's the upper deck where we sleep and in the lower level. So there is a lot of bamboo in this area. That's why we decided to make the entire thing in bamboo. It can open up and it can close uh, during the night. Um, so that's, that's one of the structures. So um, moving down uh, more to the south of Bangladesh, that's the mangrove forest, which is the Shundarbans. And um, with the sea level rise, uh, this area is very much uh, under threat. Um, this is also home to the Royal Bengal Tigers. And right above this Shundurban area, about 150 kilometers above that, um, is a site where we were designing a resort, uh, which is right here. And um, this is an absolute delta, as you see, very green. Um, the entire area is mostly about um, agriculture. So uh, as you see, it's a very farm farming kind of an agrarian landscape. And this is one of the rivers, the Popotako, and this is our site, uh, which, which is bordered by two rivers actually on two sides. Um, and that's the site, as you see. The landscape here is absolutely uh, calm and quiet and very beautiful. Uh, the landscape and also the way people live their life is very much in uh, conformity with the landscape and the nature. So it's a symbiotic relationship between human and nature. And so when we go to the site, um, and this is the kind of landscape you see, uh, mostly paddy fields, rice fields, and people uh, generally live off the land. Um, as you see, this boat is actually a trunk of a tree. So when you go there, the first impression for me was that the kind of education we get in architecture, which is about building, which is about permanence, and where uh, in a landscape, people do not try, do not make anything permanent in that sense that, that it will you know, take away the balance that exists in the land. What they do is they try to live with it. And for that reason, architecture can change, architecture can, you know, uh, it can break, it can fall off, it can be completely gone, but at the same time, they can rebuild things. So it's a, it's a kind of a relationship where the idea of an architect whose architecture will be there for hundreds of years kind of doesn't, doesn't really work. So what do you do in a landscape like that? So this idea of creating an architecture with the roaring noise just didn't seem like the right thing to do. So the idea was to learn from the land and this is probably my first project ever um, in my long spanning architecture uh, uh, career that uh, I went to actually in a, in a land uh, in my own country, which is completely unknown to me because I 
was born in Dhaka, brought up in Dhaka. And so my connection to the landscape or in or especially in a in the village atmosphere was completely missing. So for that reason, um, for me, this was almost like being a foreigner in your own country. So when I went there and and really saw the relationship, this very natural and symbiotic relationship between human and and nature really, uh, I think, gave me a sort of a grounding and, 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 and a kind of a calmness. And the idea that you really do not know a lot, you need to learn a lot from the land uh, before even starting to build anything there. So that's why uh, we started to learn how to how people generally build. So the act of building in a landscape like this is always about dig and mound. So it's a flat land. So they dig the earth, bring it up, create a mound, and on the mound they place these houses and homesteads. And a homestead element is always about these all the different things that this is this would be a program of a house, as you see, and um, and it has rooms to live and then. Um, kitchen, storage, everything are these tiny little in, and also uh, you know, chicken coops and places for the uh, domestic animals to live and everything. And these elements, which are the program of the house is always gathered in a very um, casual manner or, or it seems casual, but definitely there is some rational around the courtyard and it creates a very soft um, boundary uh, which kind of leaks from one courtyard to another. And uh, it's a very communal, social way of living uh, where you are living in a community and one family is allowed to move to another's courtyard. So it's a very free-flowing free space where everybody is like one large family. So which is kind of really a beautiful way of living, especially when you go from a city uh, going to the villages, this is what you really appreciate, the community and the communal feeling that people really have. Uh, so this is, let's say, one of the villages, which is the uh, potter's village. So these are most more skill-based villages. So these people are potters. And, and there's, again, another village, which is, these are all very close by to the site. And this is a, a, a bamboo weaver's village because there is a lot of bamboo here and they make baskets and things like that. Um, so these are the villages that we tried to document even before we started to design. And doing so, we created a really nice relationship with the people in the village and trying to understand how they build their own houses with the material that are locally available, which is mud mostly, uh, very soft mud. And the houses are generally built with mud. And one a very interesting form of roof that used to be a part of the Bengal Delta is this uh, pitched, a curved pitch roof, which is known as the Bangla roof. And the Bangla is also the word which generated the idea of bungalow uh, when the British were here um, and, and it was a British colony. That's how the, uh, the idea of bungalow came into being. So the Bangla roof is also something very, very much was there, but you don't see that anymore kind of got extinct. So this is the site we had. And uh, our idea was to bring people by boat. And there's another road also. So this would be more for the back of our facilities, but people would be coming by boat and it would be mostly a walking uh, site. And we tried to design it in a way that it could really emulate the idea of a village where you have these huts where people can live uh, with this similar kind of a uh, curved pitch roof. And so these are the different typology of the bungalows that we designed uh, with a thick mud wall and uh, a thatch roofing. And every house or every hut has a courtyard of their own. And so we invited the villagers to come and build with us. So it was a process where the villagers also get benefited. Uh, it's a kind of a local economy that uh, gets developed in that area. We are also sourcing materials from the location. We're trying to engage the younger generation in that uh, area who are mostly looking towards the city life and, and much more uh, you know, aspiring to go to the city and starting a job, uh, which definitely doesn't end up uh, being uh, such a dignified 
life anyway. So it would be much better for them to live in the city, uh, live in their own villages and, and try to recreate it in a, in a better way. So basically that was also one of the ideas to engage the younger generation to create the connection that was completely missing and especially the pride of being uh, in village, the pride of place. So that's the method we employed. Basically, the um, uh, you know the the process of building with sun dried mud brick mortar, sun um, uh, you know, earth mortar, and the entire building is built by the villagers themselves. So, uh, in a way, when we started the project uh, last, I think in two thousand thirteen, um, you know, I was really not sure about this whole process like is it being architecture am i being architect enough to to engage people and but you know at that point in time that seemed to be absolutely the right thing to do in that location so and now i think i'm quite confident because that really gave me a certain idea of venturing out you know, from our mainstream understanding of architecture and um, education towards something which is far more, I think, to do with the people and land, and especially uh, in a time when we are really concerned about our own existence and our own, um, you know, uh, the climate issues. Uh, it just seems so much right that you, you know, work with land, with people, and create something which is, uh, you know, which, which really ensures um, the fact that you can create a balance the balance that has been completely disrupted by our overconsumption. So this seemed like a, an approach in a place which is really, really, very, um, very much um, in a quiet, uh, very soft dynamic landscape. And one of the projects that we did afterwards, once we finished the buildings, uh, is to create this engagement with the community to build their build them up to to create a certain kind of um, um, generating their income and everything. So we did craft diversification workshops. We've given them all different kind of sort of a connection and creating C uh, you know a savings group <clears throat> with uh, with a group called Poka, um, which is run by Hasibul Kubir. Um, and many other young architects, community architects. So the community architects group uh, helped us uh, to create this connection, so invited them. And uh, so we did craft diversification workshops. We've created savings group among the women so they can save money. And they also have different kind of crafts uh, that they can uh, create uh, and sell to the uh, guests in the resort. So we mapped the entire villages, so to give them an understanding of what they have and what they can build upon um, and to create a better environment for themselves, um, kitchens or you know, sanitation in every different aspect. So one, that, one of that project, and this is a project by Hasibul Kabir, which is uh, about an hour's drive from, uh, from our site. So where he has really very successfully built up this uh, these houses, which are $1,500 houses, uh, two-story houses where um, people are living. Um, uh, these, are, these were slums, and so they, they upgraded the slum. And uh, this is also done in the same technique where they save money and then they, they actually give them themselves the loan and then make these houses. So this is a two-story house with a toilet, which is $1,500. We took the same model of an idea and introduced that as a project or a studio project for the Harvard GST students. So they came to the site, they visited these houses to understand what is possible in $1,500 and, um, and with, with a $2,000, how better they can uh, you know, create a, a nicer environment for people. And brick is an aspirational material for the villagers. They think brick gives them a better social standing and also a bit of a permanence <clears throat> they want to move away from earth which we do not always agree but you know you can always talk to them and create this as uh, uh, come to a point where they both can agree uh, so th the students had hands-on workshops to understand the materials uh, that are available they talked to the we had five different clients so they talked to the clients and 
and basically discussed uh, about their own aspirations to be able to then design. So after the studio was over, we had a small uh, exhibition of the student projects um, and the clients actually came and saw and, and they appreciated the ideas very much. Uh, we would like to build a few of the houses, uh, probably not the same way as uh, the students suggested, but taking some of the ideas from there. So this is again another group of students talking to another uh, uh, potential client where the, this, this is a house for only three ladies, uh, the, the man uh, or the son of this lady actually passed away. And so now there are only three women and trying to survive with a very minimum means. So to give them a certain kind of a opportunity where they can also use their house as a place where from where they can generate income was also something that the students wanted to look into. So that's the exhibition. So these are some of the houses that they designed uh, and they have to make sure that this is buildable within $2,000. Uh, and, and, and an architect and an engineer from my office uh, were going through all the different BOQ and the calculations that they have done to make sure that it works. Uh, so these are, this is the potter's house. As you see that they have tried to use the pottery as a means of ventilation. And um, so it gives a certain sense of brick, but in a different way, earth and uh, pottery and then having some um, tin roofs and bamboo structures. This is again, another project where the student thought of using the facade as a shelving place because they had smaller space and they needed their potteries to be, to be stacked or stored. So the facade becomes a storage area. Uh, this is the women's house where they were given a small tea stall where from where they can sell tea and snacks to the villagers. So, so all these different kind of uh, projects came up. And then uh, a book uh, report, this is the $2,000 home co-creating in the Bengal Delta was published by Harvard GST. Uh, this is also again, the same idea that I took to uh, the Venice Biennale when we were invited by the um, curators uh, of um, Grafton Architects in 2018. And the idea of vernacular and how this can inform us um, to have a better symbiotic uh, life or uh, where, um, you know, since vernacular has turned into this uh, 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 something of the past because of our over standardization that we need to really look into the past to be able to reconfigure our way to the future. And so this was our site, as you see here, we were, so what we did is we took different elements from the villages where women are using or making them and also in very much in use. So this is a granary, as you see here, made by women of the villages. We took a boat, we took a lot of different things and they were really generous and gifted us all these different elements from their own household, which are still in use. And we took them and we created this installation of a, of a Bengali hut or a Bengali courtyard, I would say, uh, and showcasing all these different elements uh, so the houses, as you see, are in lines, but all the different elements that are, you know, actually created from the earth are very much visible and in the place. So that's a, that's a grinder, a big grinder. That's, a, that's the stove. So really very interesting elements that you find uh, in the landscape and, you know, how people really create these things. Um, I'll just go very quickly over maybe one project more um, because I think I'm running out of time. So Bangladesh is in, this, in, the, in the line where the Tropic of Cancer right here. So we have this subtropical climate where we have a monsoon season and then we have a dry season. And the temperatures are quite moderate. It, you don't really need uh, insulation in that sense to, to kind of keep you um, comfortably uh, away from the harshness of the climate. It's a very moderate climate where you can open up and you can create a pavilion. So, you know, if you see essentially for a living, all you need is four columns and a roof to cover you. And there you have architecture. So even in the first building in Bangladesh, uh, in, in the modern times, in the 1950s, is this building, the Fine Art Institute, designed by Mazar al-Islam. 
Um, and, and he built this very new idea that he brought in uh, from his studies and created this beautiful architecture where it was completely open and really embraced the idea of ventilation and keeping things more blurred, uh, blurring the edge, I would say, between the inside and the outside. So some of our projects um, in the while we are practicing also addresses the same idea of uh, indoor-outdoor relationship and how you can open it up uh, to make it a much more uh, natural space. Uh, adding a courtyard into the house, let's say open to sky so that you allow rain to come in. And um, so one of the apartment buildings that we designed, it's a 12 story residential tower um, uh, where you have two apartments on two sides. It also tries to open up as much as possible on the facades so that it allows the airflow and breeze to come in. Um, so this is the West Sun, as you can see, and then so basically the building actually moves. And so as uh, Joseph was mentioning about breathability of a building and how we try to see buildings not as machines, but more as, as a being where we as humans connect with them and we create memories, we live in them. So it's, it's an integral part of us. It's an extension of us. So it's like the second or the third skin of our body. So that's why it's important for the building to breathe also and to have the natural air and the ventilation to come into the building uh, to be able to give us what is required. So in many ways, we try to address that. So this is one of the projects where we try to use that long veranda that is already there in our landscape. In our old houses, you see these long verandas, which acts as a buffer. So to take that veranda and then to wrap it all around the building to get this buffer space where, which can be then vegetated, you can, you can most of the time spend that, spend your time on the veranda as well. Use the rooms more for private affairs. So yeah, so, so understanding how wind flows into a building was important. So this project really helped us where, where we tried to create the stack and the stacks actually helps for the air to move into the building. So the stacks uh, are something that I've used in many of the projects that we designed. Uh, so this is the French German embassy where we tried to open this up in the central atrium, as you see here, and the cutting the corners so that it allows the air to flow in. Uh, so that's the building. So you have the end corners cut to let the airflow happen. So that stack or the atrium actually helps. Again, this is also another building where we have the stack in the middle. And these are the corner courtyards, which allows the airflow to happen. And so, so the breathability of the building is not just about the facade, but also creating the building in a way where you create these high pressure and low pressure zones and allowing the air to flow. And flowing air and choosing the materials is also something we've always um, you know, focused on. Um, material, as I was mentioning, for us is brick uh, because it's a delta. We don't have any other material, we have earth. So we bake the earth, we make brick and that's what architecture has been about uh, in these areas. This is a Buddhist monastery. We have Buddhist monasteries from second century, third century BC. And um, so you'll see them all made in brick and, and still existing. The terracotta temples that we have uh, from the Hindu dynasties are also beautifully intricately curved with mud and, 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 and that's it. Earth can be turned into so many beautiful things. And we have these really wonderful masons still date who really create this craft of brick uh, laying. And so we have really good connection with a lot of people who does these handcraftings. And imperfection and handcrafting is something we had to embrace um, uh, while we were creating our own architecture because when you create something with hand, it has its own own understanding and its own uh, beauty as it is. And so we have created this really long standing relationship with all the people who work with us. Um, be it a, you know, this, uh, let's say a mosaic or, or someone who's working with tiles. So it's a really long 30, 40 year relationship that we have. So this is, this is the city of Dhaka, which is one of the fastest growing cities and a mega city. Um, and so basically, um, 
a lot of projects are built in, in the city, but today I wanted to focus more on the periphery um, of, the bang of Bangladesh, just to show you what are the things that we are working on, especially um, in terms of um, the architecture that we, we've been doing. I would just probably like to showcase one last project. Uh, I'll, I'll just go very quickly. I won't be showing this. This is a museum which we did, um, the Independence Monument and our museum um, uh, of independence. Uh, but I would rather skip because I don't think I'm kind of running out of time. So I'll just go very quickly over it. It's a museum which is below grade. Um, as you see, that's the plan. Uh, you go down into the museum below and you see the uh, all the different activities of how Bangladesh was born through a war. Uh, it was a civil war between Bangladesh uh, or we, for us, it was, it was our liber liberation war between Pakistan and Bangladesh. And then finally, uh, we became a free nation. Um, but I, I, I'm just going to skip this. Uh, you can see this on many of my <laughs> talks probably. So this is the tower that we built with uh, using glass panels. Uh, it's a tower of light uh, where it's lit out from the outside and in the night it really glows uh, beautifully. The idea was that freedom is something that you cannot really grasp. It's all about light uh, and, and a beacon of hope to the future. And so I'll just finish it with a mosque project that we designed um, and for which we got the Arakan Award. Uh, so that's the that's the last limit of the city of Dhaka, as you see, that's on the northern edge with that blue dot. Uh, that's the site for the mosque. And this is an area which used to be a farmland, but with the, with the growth of the city, it really became very much uh, a, a settlement where people started living. And so in that area, uh, my grandmother, as you see here, she uh, donated a piece of land and she wanted me to design a mosque. Uh, you know, for that area because there was no mosque in that place. It was still a village-like atmosphere. So under the jackfruit tree, that was the first um, uh, prayer that we had. And you can see my grandmother sitting there right uh, before the haystack um, uh, and then declaring that this will become uh, a mosque. And going into the, so the, the way I started the project is to understand what is a mosque, uh, how did it came into being, and so to go to the very beginning of uh, Islam, let's say, and to see uh, that the first mosque of Islam was built by the prophet Muhammad. And uh, it was basically a house form that was taken and elongated to give it a space for congregation. So there is no prescription of mosque anywhere uh, in Quran or anywhere. The entire world can be your mosque. You do not need any kind of real structure to, to pray. All you need is a direction towards the Kaaba or the or Mecca, uh, and then um, and then a congregation and a clean space, and that's it. Uh, you can anywhere uh, can be a space for prayer. So um, so, it, but you know, as as Islam grew from that time on and went to different directions, it took to many different forms, um, and these are the different kind of mosques that you see all around the world. Uh, taking to the local culture and the custom and the construction techniques and the climate and everything. Uh, so it, it really has changed and evolved throughout the centuries. And in Bangladesh or in our own context, these are the kind of mosques that you see as the first or the early mosques. And also taking to the same kind of construction technique, using brick as the material and, um, you know, trying to make it as open as possible with the openings. Um, all throughout. But the mosque has completely lost its values uh, of being a, a place of worship to a much more a place for accommodation. And, you know, how many people can you accommodate in a congregation or let's say even about income generation, turning it into shops uh, in the lower level. So there is no character of a mosque anymore, or even the symbols that has kind of becoming much more about mosque, the moment you have a mosque, you have to have a dome and a minaret, but in the earlier mosque, you never find that. So this is not something that you really require. Rather, I try to focus, instead of focusing on symbols, I try to focus on the idea of light and spirituality. And the reason why people go to a religious institution 
is to create a connection with the divine or God or about purity of oneself. So that is more about the spirituality. And so I try to focus on the idea of light. And so that's the site, as you see, uh, the, the direction of Mecca uh, creates a 13 degree shift with the site location. So the prayer hall had to be shifted in a direction. So if you see, that's the site, which is 75 by 75 feet. And, and the prayer hall, I had to shift it uh, to align it to the direction of Mecca. And for that reason, I introduced this circular drum volume that uh, four corner courtyards, but I was talking about the stacks or the spaces that allows the airflow to happen. Uh, so those are the four corners that allows that. And so, yeah, so the, this is basically the wrapping of the building and that's the main prayer hall and the corners actually helps to make the building breathe. So this is uh, probably my first initial conceptual sketch, sketch where I tried to take the idea of the language of architecture that used to exist. And this is a load bearing structure. All the, all the area around the prayer hall is also load bearing structure. And the central prayer hall is the only place where we have the columns. So that's the brickwork uh, load bearing. Uh, there is no column here. It's entirely on brick. And the central space is the only thing that we have on columns. And uh, so these are the plans and the elevations and sections that you see. Um, uh, and, and it's also, again, the breathing wall where uh, we try to make it porous. So the porosity helps the air to flow in. Uh, so that's the landscape, as you see, where uh, you have the entire site becoming completely filled with buildings and settlements. And at one point you won't be able to see the mosque anymore. So the facades really didn't make uh, any difference or you do not really need that. It's more about internalizing and looking within than without. So that's the building. My grandmother did leave us some amount of money to start the project, but later on, uh, as I showed you the groundbreaking ceremony that was 2006 uh, September and she passed away the same year in, in December. So I had to build this project in a, as, a, as I promised to her, but at the same time, um, sourcing materials, arranging for the funds and everything. So I became the builder and the designer, the client all at the same time. So, and also engaging the local people. So the locals also had to uh, also help in raising fund and giving whatever was possible for themselves. So that's the point. And then you see, these are the corner courts and it helps to breathe the building. And it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have any, anything other than a few fans to, to keep the space cool. And it really is an absolutely beautifully cool space during the summer months. So that, that's what you see. Um, yeah, so as I said, uh, it, it was funded by locals. So the funding was a very, you know, one of our biggest challenges. So the space is completely unadorned. It's a very basic space, very elemental. Uh, the only source is those light uh, dots, which are the ornament of the space. And, and as the sun moves throughout the day or even throughout the season, uh, this entire space constantly changes. So the light, uh, you know, makes the building a kind of a live space that reacts to the atmosphere, reacts to the, uh, to the changing circumstances and everything. So, so yeah, I'll finish it here, I think. Thank you so much uh, for listening. And